So first there was Hurricane Irma. Now there's Hurricane Maria. And everyone I know is like me, reeling just from the, the stories of surviving the storms. I've been talking to you for the last uh, 10 days or so, and everybody has their stories of surviving the storm. And you know what? I have my stories of surviving Irma too, so I thought, uh, since I had your attention, I would tell, tell, tell it to you. Uh, when the evacuation order came, you know the evacuation order? I mean, you know, the, the bullhorns going down the street, get out, get out. My, my family uh, left town. All of you guys uh, that stayed put, come what may, God bless you. But we left. Chris and I, literally, when the, when the order came, we dropped what we were doing. We dropped it. We went to the back closet of our house. We piled all of the photographs that we hadn't let yet digitized into the back of the car, right? We, we got a small box of important documents, the stuff we're supposed to have, the birth certificate, the, the passports, uh, the, the car titles. Um, we put that into the car. We we went over to the kitchen. We, we took the, the crock pot of chicken that we were cooking, and, and we, we took it out of the warmer, and we put it into the refrigerator where we figured it wouldn't stink as bad when we come back to a closed-up 100-degree house with no electrical power, if there was even a house to come back to, because at the time it was supposed to be a Category 5 hurricane destroying everything, right? And then we threw three days' worth of T-shirts and underwear into the back of the car, and we headed north. Whew. And as we drove away, I thought, oh, okay, there's security. But then I started thinking about all of you who stayed. I kept watching Facebook. I kept texting you. I felt your pain, and I was, then I became anxious for you as your roofs were quaking and as you huddled in your safe rooms. And more than once, I couldn't help but thinking, I should have just stayed. I mean, considering how freaked out I am every time someone I care about loses power or feels, feels a thump on their roof or loses a pool cage, I should have just stayed because leaving Dodge did not help my anxiety at all. Even after the storm passed, right? While you were all just cleaning up from the, and assessing the damage, what were we doing? We were still in the car, bumper to bumper, on our way back south, looking for gas so we didn't have to walk and come, and come home and help. You know, my friend Brian was one of the sturdy type uh, that stayed, and they weathered, he, he and his family weathered the storm in his house, his wife and kids and cats and dogs. And he said, with all of the roaring winds and pieces of his house flying off, huddled in a laundry room with all these people on top of each other and dogs and animals, he had never been so scared in his whole life. He said in order to save $500 on evacuation hotels, it was now going to cost him $3,000 in post-traumatic stress disorder counseling. <laughs> I can believe it, can't you? <laughs> because when it comes to security, there was no win. Irma was definitely a lose-lose proposition. It didn't matter if you stayed. It didn't matter if you went. But here's what I discovered. And if you were here last week, you heard Pastor West discover something similar. Other than worrying about the welfare of people I cared about, um, I surprised myself at how little I cared about my stuff. Just before Chris and I got into the car to leave all frantic, uh, we took a last look around the house to see if there was anything that we couldn't live without if we lost it, anything at all that was completely essential. We surveyed all the stuff we had accumulated along the way, the cars in the garage, the furniture, the art, the decor, yes, even my shoes and handbags, <laughs> yes. And the bottom line was, nah, nothing. It could all go away if it had to. You know, in the big picture of things, none of it was essential. And, you know, I had a philosophic, philosophical moment there where I couldn't help but wonder why in the world we acquired it all to begin with, right? I mean, why? Maybe I thought, like, if I have all this stuff around me, uh, it would bring some sort of security that life was predictable and controllable or something like that. I don't know, but it didn't bring that. You know why? Because a big bad mama named Irma could come and whisk it all away in a moment's notice. You know, I found out the hard way, and, and maybe some of you did too, about what was essential and what really wasn't essential. Over the past seven weeks, we've been living in the 23rd Psalm and this is our last Sunday in our message series called 23 Everyday Essentials. And over these past weeks, with one Sunday off due to our pal Irma, uh, Pastor George and Pastor Wes have taught us all about what really are essentials for living by uh, this psalm written by one of the great men of the Bible, King David. 
Now, David was a shepherd boy who God called to be a king, and he wrote about things uh, essential for his journey from here to there. Essentials. Essentials. Essentials is a good word. It means what is absolutely necessary for, for the journey, what we can't do without. What is it that if we didn't have it, we simply could not live without it? Those things are the essentials, right? And that's what the 23rd Psalm is about. The big essential I think we all discovered from the beginning, uh, we found out in week one, is that Jesus is our good shepherd. <laughs> When David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. Now, now David, being an ex-shepherd himself, he understood shepherding. Uh, he, he knew it was essential for the sheep to have a good guide. And I've found, and maybe you have too, that, and we've had to admit that maybe we need a shepherd uh, too to lead our lives because we tend to be just like sheep when it comes to like making our own dis- choices and decisions. Uh, and sheep are pretty dumb, right? Sheep are pretty dumb. Left to our own devices, left to my own device. We sheep, we'll, we'll, we'll nibble in our directions with our own bright ideas and our own conclusions uh, right off the edge of a cliff. I need to hear one voice, just one voice, a good shepherd's voice to lead and guide me. Watch this clip that we found about the shepherd's voice. (laughs) One more time. Wow. (laughs) Jesus said, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. And don't we need this, church? Don't we need this? I do. I need a perfect shepherd who can give me peace, show me the right ways, assist me through the dark valleys, comfort me and strengthen me and bless me. I need a good shepherd whose staff can lead me onwards and whose rod can whap me upside of the head every now and then to straighten my paths. I need a good shepherd. And thanks be to God that we all have one, and that would be Jesus, and praise God that he has accepted the job. Hallelujah. That's security. That's security, knowing I can follow a shepherd who will lead me well. Because no matter how I've tried, and believe me, friends, I have tried, I have tried every which way. I haven't found a way to lead my own self into security. It hasn't happened. In my life, I've had several different jobs, as far-reaching as a paralegal to Christmas ornament manufacturer. 
I've lived in different parts of the country, from New York to L.A. and everywhere in between. I've had different husbands. I've had different houses full of different kinds of possessions. All the details, it seems like they're always changing. They won't stay put. They come and go. They won't stay still just long enough for me to get some security for a change. Anybody relate? And I don't think I'm alone in this. I see others struggling in the same way to find this essential security that we just need. And they find it in so many, try to find it so many different ways. Titles or, or prestige or through 401ks or relying on people. But then what happens, right? We know what happens. People that we rely on, they die or they leave. 401ks, poof, go away in the recession. Stuff is lost in hurricanes. And then the world, the world is always trying to find it too. I read the news, don't you? All the wars, the violence, the racism, the hate, all the sorrow and fear all over the world. Everybody's running amok on its own will, trying to find the right way. You know, when we look at it all, we might want to hopelessly conclude that there is just no security to be found anywhere at all. There's just none. It may seem like there is no assurance whatsoever of being cared for or cared about. No rhyme or reason to things. No direction that just won't go away in a flash. But that's not true. I'm here to proclaim that there is perfect security in the world, and his name is Jesus. He is the good shepherd who leads me into the security I really need. He is the one who will give us everyday security. So today I want us to look at security, that one last great big essential that our good shepherd gives us that we just can't seem to give to ourselves no matter how we try, the one last overarching essential that covers it all. David, the king, ends his Psalm 23 uh, with an assurance. And so let's together read the last verse of the 23rd Psalm together. It's on the screen. Go. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. We, we're we're going to want to take a close look at that security in that verse. And we want to answer this question together. What will I be assured of if I consistently allow the Lord to be my shepherd? What will it be? If stuff and people and jobs can't give me assurance, then what can Jesus give that makes up for all of that? What assurance will I receive when I follow Jesus instead of what the world has to offer in his stead. Well, get out your pen and fill in the blank. First, if I allow Jesus alone to be my shepherd, I will experience the relentless grace of God. I will experience the relentless grace of God. Let's read together the first part of verse 6. It's on the screen. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. You know, some versions of this say, surely uh, your goodness and mercy will pursue me all the days of my life. And mercy is good too. I like mercy. In fact, if you're writing things, write mercy next to unfailing love because mercy is good too, right? And you know what else I love? I'll tell you what. It's the first word in this verse. What's the first word in this verse? Sure. Say it loud. Woo, I love surely. You know why? You know why I love the word surely? Because it means there's no question about it. Surely. Surely this is going to happen. Surely is a security word. <laughs> King David is proclaiming security. God is good all the time. Good. He's good. God is so good. Not good just like, meh, he's sort of good. No, good. Like God created the world and he looked at everything and he said, that's good. That's kind of good. David is saying God is good all the time. And with Jesus leading him, uh, God's goodness and love will pursue him, chase after him, never let him get away. Every single day of every single week, of every single month, of every single year of his life, no matter what he's done, no matter what he'll ever do, God is going to chase him down relentlessly with grace upon grace and never let him get away all the days of his life. You know, in another psalm, David says it this way, Psalm 139.7. He says, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. Now, that's David. <laughs> but me, on the other hand, <laughs> I, I have sometimes looked in the rear view mirror at the chaos of my life. And frankly, uh, some of that stuff 
has haunted me. I'm sober now since 1985, uh, but in my active addiction, I'll tell you, I did some things that had consequences that lasted a long, long time. My kids were hurt irreparably. Marriages, finances, oh my goodness, these, these painful remnants of my past, they're the things that seem to pursue me forever. I couldn't get away from their presence. In fact, whenever I tried to look back, it, it was very much like that scene from Jurassic Park. <laughs> right? T-Rex, objects in mirror are closer than they appear. Does this look familiar to you? Do you ever feel like this sometimes? Am I the only one? No. <laughs> we all have, but Jesus. Jesus tells me it doesn't have to be that way. No. Now, I don't know how he does it. I have no idea, but when I look behind me while holding on to my shepherd, Jesus, I don't have to see the mistakes. Instead, I can see God's goodness and mercy and grace and love carrying me through all of that. When I look at the past, I can celebrate that God has always been chasing me with grace. I don't have to cringe at the debris of my past. No, for me, seeing God was always there, that's security, friends. You know, I spoke to a friend the other day. Um, about a serious problem that he was having um, in a relationship that he was in. And he was really, really broken up about it. I mean, everything looked pretty grim. Lots of bad things had happened between them. Lots of bad history. You ever have that? <laughs> but after just a 10-minute conversation and prayer about some healing that Jesus might do, um, something began to change. I could see it. You could see the light bulb of Jesus just go on. His face softened, his eyes lit up, and, and we both got to be in awe over how in just literally minutes a situation that had seemed so bleak suddenly turned hopeful with a breath breathed over it by Jesus. I'm going to tell you what the security of God pursuing me with goodness and mercy and grace has done for me. Because now when I look over my shoulder, it's been goodness and mercy chasing me, not condemnation and judgment, friends. It's been goodness and mercy following me, not shame and self-loathing. It has been goodness and God's unfailing love chasing me down, not failures and faults, not my addictions and afflictions following me. No, but it's always been God's goodness and unfailing love from the start. God's goodness and mercy chasing me down, not defeats, not deficiencies, friends. I know you need this too. I know you need this too. You need the security of his grace and his mercy chasing you down in every circumstance. Nothing formed against you in the past can harm you. And together we can say like King David did, the Lord is my shepherd. Even if people have betrayed me in the past, even if people have deserted me, even if stuff goes away in Armageddon, it doesn't matter. I have all that I need. And that's first. And here's the other assurance. Number two, the other assurance I'll get when I let Jesus be my shepherd is I will experience continual intimacy with God. I will experience continual intimacy with God. See, see with God's goodness and mercy giving me security of God's constant grace and presence in my past, I want to know my God better. Who is this God? I want to know him. I want to follow my shepherd Jesus into the future. I want to know him better. In fact, read the last part of what King David wrote. The last part of verse 6 with me. It's on the screen. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. You know, a lot of times when we read the 23rd Psalm, where, where do we read it? Memorial services, funerals. And we read, I will live in the house of the Lord forever. And oh, what a great assurance that is that our loved one, now departed, this earth um, is with Jesus. And it's so good to have assurance that when we die, uh, we're going to live with Jesus forever and we're going to have continuous intimacy uh, with him too. That's something to be so happy about and to cheer about. And then we know that in the end times, when all is said and done, we know that Jesus wins, right? We know Jesus wins, and all who call upon the name of Jesus will be resurrected to a new heaven and a new earth, and that's something to cheer about, too. It's amazing. Jesus' best friend, John, um, he died an old man, exiled on an island uh, called Patmos, and while he was there, he saw some visions of the future kingdom of God, and we read them in our Bible in the book of Revelation, and I want to give you a foretaste of glory from God's lips 
to John's ear, Revelation 21, 3 through 4, when he says, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He'll wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things will be gone forever. Hallelujah. Every tear gone. No more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. And that's what John saw, and it's what we get to look forward to someday when we die and when Jesus comes again, whichever comes first, friends. What an amazing assurance. It is huge. Yet, yet when I look around this morning, I can see that all of us are not yet dead. Uh, some of you with your eyes closed may be sleeping or making grocery lists. Uh, but you're not dead. You're all alive. We're all alive and breathing. Uh, so although we do want, obviously, assurance of a future life with Christ, we even more need an assurance of a present life with Christ. It's not so much where will I go if I die tonight, but more what will I do if I live tomorrow? It's not so much if I should die before I wake, but what if I should wake before I die? An essential of our life is intimacy with God today, now. That goodness and mercy we just talked about, uh, following us in our past, also waits for us in our future. We can live in the house of the Lord beginning today. Now, here's the truth. I, I've had my turn at being afraid of the future. You know, if it wasn't the past trying to haunt me, it was the future trying to frighten me. Fill me with anxiety. What will happen with my wayward kids? Anybody have wayward kids? Will my marriage survive? Never did before. How will the finances all work out? Will my loved ones survive this sickness? Are there more hurricanes coming? But then Jesus says, I will take care of you, Arlene. Rest assured, there's nothing in your future you need to fear because you have a good shepherd who's got everything under control forever. Every single day from now on, you will live in my house, Arlene, and you will be intimate with me, surrendering and praying and hearing my encouragement. I will be your God. Oh, and let me tell you, friends, intimacy with God is so good. You know, for years, one of my sons has struggled with opioid addiction. And fear and guilt has wanted to overtake me. And, and, and some know what that's like. Do you know what that's like? It was so hard. Even as I was praying, even as Jesus was telling me in prayer again and again, I am God of the past, present, and future. I am leading the way. Follow me and you'll get through this. Even through all of that, it was hard. You know, a couple of years ago, there was a day when I finally did it, I finally handed my own staff and my own rod over to Jesus. And I told him, okay, I will let go of my son so I will have my hands free to grasp you. And guess what? Jesus has done miracles with my son since that day. And Anthony, if you are watching today online like you sometimes do, I know you also are praising God for your own sobriety, just like I am. <laughs> do you know there is no way I could let God be my shepherd. There's no way I could get intimacy with him without being in the Bible every single day seeking his guidance and friends. I just would advise it. Uh, open the word of God. Seek him in devotions and prayer. He's waiting with that goodness and grace, the same goodness and grace and mercy he has always given you in the past to take good and merciful care of your future while you are living out your present in the house of the Lord rent free. It's a good deal. You know, in King David's time, um, the house of the Lord was the temple. And it was in the temple that people came to praise God, to worship God, to give thanks to God and sacrifices to God. The temple uh, was where people experienced God's presence. Uh, when, when David proclaims that he'll live in the house of the Lord forever, um, David uh, is saying, I know that 
the presence of God is not just inside the temple. No, but inside of David. He was the temple. When David proclaims that he'll live in the house of the Lord forever, it's more like a proclamation of how he will live his future days living a life of worship and intimacy and presence of God in all the areas of his life. In fact, in Psalm 27, he says, one thing I ask from the Lord, this day, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. And in Psalm 84, he proclaims, better is one day in your courts, God, than a thousand elsewhere. David wants to move in with God, and better yet, have God move into his heart. It's like David, it's like David is saying, in response to everything you have given me, Lord, in, in response to everything you've done for me, I will actively live in your house as a family participant. I will praise you. I will worship you. Oh, friends, I want and need this security. That God is always going to be there, and he's always been there, past, the present, and the future. I know you do too. The security that Jesus is my good shepherd. He won't leave us hanging in times of need or doubt or when we're going the wrong way. No. I want to live in the house of the Lord forever, 100% housing security, friends, because God won't ever kick you out. He won't divorce you. He won't get mad at you. He won't abandon you. He won't wish you didn't live there anymore. He will open his house to you forever, and you'll be his family, connected, wanted, loved. You can rest assured. That's intimacy with God. Letting God do his job, which is taking care of you, and you doing your part, praising him and loving others. Now, I am not perfect at this. Far from it. You know, those, there are times I am still filled with remorse of the past. And at times I'm still filled with anxiety over the future, even knowing the Lord is my shepherd. You know, King David wasn't perfect either. David was very much like you and me. He had days of greatness, uh, close to God and God's will, and he had days of great failure, just running around sinning like crazy. Even still, the 23rd Psalm was David's wrap-up of the whole journey. When he looks back, he sees the goodness and mercy of God pursuing him all the days of his life. When he looks forward, he lives a life of, with God forever because God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And when he sa- surveyed it all, he could say with great assurance and security for his present day, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. I want us to proclaim the same thing today. Let's do it. Let's settle on who we will follow and what we are assured of in great security that it's so. In fact, let's stand and do it together. Let's stand and let's read together the 23rd Psalm to end this series. It's on the screen. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Our security's name is Jesus Christ. He is the good shepherd. Today, let him be your shepherd to guide you. Because no hurricane can take that away from you. No wind will ever knock his love over. No flood will ever wash it away. No, God's love will never run in fear, will never forsake you. God's love expressed through Jesus is all the security you or I will ever need. But that is essential. 
And so if you've never made Jesus your shepherd before, I'm going to be right down here. Come and see me, and we, we'll make that happen today. But if Jesus is your shepherd, and maybe we've just wandered away like sheep do, come to the altar and say, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you because he is here for you. The altar is open.